the UN is saying that we have 10 weeks left in the world's warehouse for global wheat. So these are the final conditions. There is no right of the individual anymore. We're going to have a food crisis. It's a question of how large. They don't want to bring the poor up. They want to bring the rich down. Welcome back to another episode of Truth Matters. I'm Matthew Shanshe here with Mackenzie Drebbit. Mackenzie, it's good to have you back on. Yes, it's been a little while. There has been a lot of talk lately, which is why we're doing the podcast today about food shortages. And there's a lot of things going on globally right now that I think people have noticed, and they have a lot of questions about this topic. Yeah, so how do these food shortages fit in? And how does it all fit back within the prophetic picture? We're going to take a look a little bit at that today. Yeah, so if we just, uh, before we jump right into all the things happening globally and all the news articles, what the UN is saying about all this, um, we would like to just quickly see what the Bible has to say in regard to this topic. Yeah, so we see Jesus is talking to his disciples, and we have this account in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we're going to look at the just the language here in Luke chapter 21. And Jesus has just told him that the temple is going to be destroyed, but he's also talking about uh, not just the time that he was in, but a time to come when his second coming would occur. And the disciples wanted to know, uh, what the signs of the end and what the signs of these things uh, will be. And so in that, Jesus tells them a couple of key points that I think we're going to pull out that, that apply, yes, throughout history, but are also kind of like indicators for when they happen in history and these things start coming together and you see them all happening around the same time. Well, we're, we're getting close to something uh, much larger happening. And what we see in Luke 21 verse 10 it says, then he said unto them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There's about four total qualifications here or identifying marks that we can see within this. He says, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In the following verse 11, we see uh, great earthquakes in diverse places and famines and pestilence. Well, let's just pull that apart really quick and say, has there been... Uh, recently nation against nation we definitely see that right now we see uh, the war between russia and ukraine there's actually been many conflicts going in uh, other parts of the country as well, our countries as well in asia and we're definitely seeing that being fulfilling right now yeah, it's, it's just, it is happening. We can see that that's happening. What about pestilences? Has there been an issue with pent pestilences or pandemics within the last couple of years? There for sure has. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, now we're starting to see the a lot of conversation around the concept of, of uh, famines or food shortages for, for an easier, more modern term. So let's kind of go through and see what else we can learn about this? What else can we understand about these, these famines? Are they natural famines? Are they um, produced by uh, artificial means? We, we want to take a little bit closer look at that. Uh, and as we do, I think it's important we kind of look at some of these statements through the spirit of prophecy lens, which gives us a little more uh, idea of uh, what we can expect and who is behind some of, some of these things like, like food shortages. So we have a few references here that are going back over a hundred years ago that give us an interesting insight into the connection of all the things that we're seeing right now. As famine and want and distress shall increase more and more in the world, the production of the health foods will be greatly simplified. Those who are engaged in this work should learn constantly of the great teacher who loves his people and keeps their good ever in view. Yeah, so this is just one piece of the, of the puzzle here that we see that famine and want and distress, they're going to increase, which is kind of 
interesting because not only does the world match that, but we're constantly being led to believe that if we uh, do everything right, we'll be led to a world without famine, want, and distress. But that's actually not a, a true obtainable goal. And that this is uh, some of the ways that we obtain our health and keep our health are going to be simplified. And I think we're going back to a simpler way of life. If we really are being honest, the world is changing in a direction that is, is irreversible. And the order that is trying to be implemented is going to be affecting everyone. And I think the main thing people are wondering is what they can do because we don't want to give them this feeling of uh, despair, like they, they have nothing that they can do to better themselves, to protect themselves, to what can be done in case of this. Because things are changing and things are developing and we need to know what we can do for ourselves and for our families and for our friends. Yeah, and I think that's what's important here is trying to get a, a picture and just kind of paint an, an idea in the mind of what is going to come here. So when it happens, we're prepared and also able to help others. Now, um, there are those who would say some of the statements in Luke that we just read could be applied to many different eras, but I want to look at the book, The Great Controversy, uh, page 589, where she's taking a statement that uh, is going to occur in the future, beyond the time that she was currently living in. And she's going to say, identify a character here that is the real agent behind the troubles that we're going to see coming up here in the future. It says, while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all of their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Those are pretty heavy words, ruin and desolation. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. This is, this is just in harmony with the previous statement that we're going to see an increase, but now we have uh, a specific entity behind this. Um, and this is straight out of Revelation. When Revelation talks about these miracles and lying wonders and things that the devil is actually going to come and do, and if possible, even deceive the very elect. But at the same time, he's going to be putting on these disasters so that he can become the hero. Exactly. And, and that's what we need to be preparing our hearts and minds for. The, 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 the overwhelming plan here is going to be accomplished. Uh, the, the struggle and the strife to get the conditions ready for this final unification system, they're, they're going to have uh, success. And so our, our goal isn't to try to stop these things from occurring, but prepare our hearts and minds to receive uh, Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and, and do that with the conduct and character of Christ through difficult persecutions, uh, famine, struggle, disease. These are all things common uh, throughout history. And the only thing that changes is the, the character or the conduct of the people as they go through it. And God's people have shown to have a specific character through those trials and tribulations. And, and God's remnant church will also have to have uh, that same kind of character. Uh, I'd like to read one more statement here from the Great Controversy, kind of connecting Satan's overall goal in um, bringing about these conditions and how they're the exact same as the Romish or papal church of today. And that those two, their, their agendas, their mindsets, their goals, they are one and the same. It says here, Satan's policy in this final conflict with God's people is the same that he employed in the opening of the great controversy in heaven. He professed to be seeking to promote the stability of the divine government, which is what the papacy says, while secretly bending every effort to secure its overthrow. And the very work which he was thus endeavoring to accomplish, he charged upon the loyal angels. The same policy of deception has marked the history of the Romish church. It is professed 
to act as the vice-regent of heaven while seeking to exalt itself above God and to change his law. Under the rule of Rome, those who suffered death for their fidelity to the gospel were denounced as evildoers. This is going to happen again. They were declared to be in league with Satan, and every possible means was employed to cover them with reproach, to cause them to appear in the eyes of the people and even to themselves as the vilest of criminals. So it will be now. While Satan seeks to destroy those who honor God's law, he will cause them to be accused as lawbreakers, as men who are dishonoring and bringing judgment upon the world. So these are the final conditions. Now, we're talking about food shortages, but what we're really looking at is a much larger puzzle in which food shortages lead to uh, a, a much larger outcome, a unified world under one system where a small group of people uh, is, is persecuted for what they believe. In this, in, in this statement, what it's saying is that's not only Satan's plan from the beginning, but it's the same plan that's been carried out by the, the Catholic Church and will eventually be played out again here uh, in Earth's history before all said and done. Yeah, and like we've talked about many times in the previous podcast, and especially going back to the start, explaining the connection to the systems we're not talking about the individuals inside of some of these systems, but we're talking about the systems themselves and the leadership who actually know what is happening behind these systems. So when we read in Revelation, it says, Mystery Babylon. It's a mystery. And if you actually look up the Hebrew word, what that word mystery means, it means it needs to be initiated to understand or to see. It's a secret society, which is what we've been talking about here. And the system that we see the world heading towards right now, this new world order, is this system that they've been planning for a long time. And we just need to know what we can do regarding this. So let's circle this back around to food shortages and just establish the current narrative behind this because ultimately it's going to come back and trickle back into the concepts that we find in Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti and come back into this kind of papal agenda where things are going for where we are right now in, in Earth's history. So let's first establish uh, what authority figures are saying that this food sh shortage is, are, that this is going to be a real issue. With regard to food shortage, yes, we did re re so talk about food shortages. And, uh, and it's going to be real. The, the price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. And uh, because both uh, Russia and Ukraine have been the breadbasket of Europe in terms of wheat, for example, just to give you one example. But we had a long discussion uh, in the G7 with, uh, um, the, uh, with both uh, the United States, which has a, has a significant, the third largest producer of wheat in the world, as well as Canada, which is also a major, major producer. So right from Biden, he's saying that we have been talking about food shortages. This is a real concern right now. Whether, whether created or naturally occurring, it's still happening and going to happen. Yeah, and we see that this is not just voiced by Biden, uh, who's using this as a way to get people together. You heard him talk about the G7. You've heard during the, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the coming and expanding of NATO uh, with nations that were on the sidelines before now coming in. So again, all of this is, is a very unifying effort when we understand what the agenda is kind of going towards, which we saw as, you know, Satan coming to say he's going to be the healer of the people, healing diseases and pestilence and famines. Well, all of these things kind of are, are baby steps towards getting to that end goal. And with Biden talking about food shortages, we also want to see what the private sector is saying, right? We want to see what people like it major uh, fertilizer uh, producers like Yara International. They uh, came out and said, the CEO came out and said, we're going to have a food crisis. It's a question of how large. It says replacing the volumes that Russia and Ukraine produce 
would take nearly half a decade at the very best, and in some cases may prove nearly impossible as Russia is a large source of mineral deposits found in few other locations. So here we see that some of the largest fertilizer producers are saying it could take us half a decade or more. Uh, we also see that this has triggered governments around the world to start putting controls on their food exports. It says here that the war in Ukraine has triggered an alarming global surge in government controls on the export of food. It's critical for policymakers to halt this trend, which is making a global food crisis more likely. In the space of a few weeks, the number of countries slapping on food export restrictions jumped by 25%, bringing the total number of countries to 35. By the end of March, 53 new policy interventions affecting food trade had been imposed, almost all of them regarding the restriction of food. And it says that here that history shows that the restrictions are counterproductive in the most tragic ways, meaning as the food scarcity increases, countries want to hold on more and more to their own supplies, which then has a ripple effect because everything's so interconnected globally nowadays that those countries are depending on other countries to send them things as well as send out things. And now everyone's kind of saying, well, wait a second, we want to see how bad this gets. Well, that's that's exactly what we're seeing with the war between Russia and Ukraine. So there was a sanction against Russia and then Russia is not um, is, is one of the main suppliers of uh, things like potash, phosphorus to the fertilizing sector, which this was a tower of cards just waiting to fall because when we go back 50 years, when uh, companies like Monsanto and then now being bought out by Bayer, they created the system that required these things to function. And now you have a situation in the farming community where if you don't have the seed that's genetically modified and you don't have the fertilizers required to grow that, you're, you're in trouble because you need all the pieces of that puzzle to make it work. You can't now just go and switch to organic and try and grow on your same field because you have depleted and totally destroyed the microbiology that is in the soil there. And like when I go back to Saskatchewan, where I used to live, the ground looks scary. It looks like desert ground. It's cracked and dry and gray and it's all over treated and it's amazing that you can have these beautiful crops coming out of there but it's because of the system that's put in place and if you don't have every single one of those things you're basically putting yourself to fail by pulling out one of the little pieces in that card house yeah, which, which is very easy to topple down as we're starting to see basically the whole year of 2022 has shown how delicate this house of cards really is. And now essentially we keep hearing about the bread basket. They're, they're the bread basket over there. They're the grain producers. But we just recently got information out of the UN about how much wheat the world actually has left. Well, this was very interesting because we had uh, a Security Council meeting uh, very recently where uh, Sarah Manker, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, uh, talking about the situations around food shortage. Now, we have a couple uh, uh, places. You can actually see her talking about this. There's a video of the Security Council while she actually is uh, saying this, and then many different articles referencing it but basically the UN is saying that we have 10 weeks left in the world's warehouse for global wheat that is not very long and that is only going to be exacerbated now Sarah Menker said that this is not um, the war in Ukraine and Russia is not actually the precursor of this but it's a catalyst and it's just putting fuel on the fire to the situation that we already had. Now, going back to talking about is this 
sort of uh, planned or not, there's a lot of places in Canada and in the U.S. where the farmers right now are being paid not to grow their crops. And so we have this, this like thesis, antithesis uh, going into synthesis because we're creating a situation. We're saying not to grow your own food and not to grow the crops. And then we're saying, oh, we have a food shortage. Now what do we do? Yeah, here we have this one talking about USDA farmers have this program that they can opt into. And it says here that President Joe Biden wants to combat climate change by paying more farmers not to farm. But he's already finding it's hard to make that work. His agricultural department is far behind its goal for enrolling new land in one program that has the goal of essentially paying farmers not to grow their crops. And they're saying... If you don't grow your crops, that will help us resolve climate change because those crops and the, the amount of resources it takes to grow that food is having a negative impact on the climate. And this is part of the challenge that we have when we actually start going in and pulling apart the solutions that are going to be proposed for this future climate change. And you see that on the surface, the headlines, the pamphlet all looks really great. But then you get down to the principle that, hey, in order to solve climate change, we're going to have farmers stop growing food. Now, that's like a, a simplified version of kind of sifting it down. But in essence, that is one of their goals. Here we say Joe Biden, Joe Biden sees this as a, strat a strategy. Which is, which is totally uh, ridiculous because the one thing that and now if we're concerned about carbon emissions and everything like that and cleaning up the atmosphere the one thing that does that better than anything else is plants and if we're going to stop growing plants and just fallow the, all the fields just till them under and having dry dirt we're we're exacerbating the issue so none of the pieces of the puzzle are really fitting they're just, it's compound on compounded negative impact on the entire system. And what's interesting about that is Rockefeller Foundation has a $105 billion plan or something like that to create climate sustainable food, which is going to, in essence, when you look at what that means, is lab grown food. Now, there have been tremendous breakthroughs within this type of thing. But to say, hey, farmers, don't grow your crops. Instead, we're going to push towards this climate sustainable model of food preparation. Well, what happens if that doesn't go as planned and farmers haven't grown their food and it's uh, built on a system that eventually breaks down? It's kind of like the electric car versus the gas powered vehicle. What happens if the electrification system struggles or break down? You're, you're in essence, have no viable replacement as you turn off more and more reliable uh, energy sources such as natural gas, uh, fossil fuels, things of that nature. Now, in California, they're saying to their farmers, uh, well, we've got water problems with our Colorado River, so we're going to pay you not to grow your crops so you don't use the water. Here it says as one of the people who've been offered to not grow crops. Listen to what they say about it. They say, honestly, I think I could make more money farming, but for the sake of the Colorado River, I think it's the right thing to do. Wow. Okay, we're getting into morality statements now that oftentimes when we looked at whether it was um, the secret societies whether it was the labor unions that we talked about recently, the, the whole papal agenda and ultimately Satan's agenda is to switch the mind towards this morality basis that's based on the common good of everybody else because what that allows them to do is reduce the importance of the individual within the larger structure. Then you can start defining what's good for the community and everyone has to uphold that standard rather than choose or think for oneself. And here we're seeing that that mindset is now permeating to somebody choosing not to grow food, to make less money, 
because they think it's the right thing to do. Now, I'm not saying the Colorado River levels are low and that something like that uh, would help the water level rise, but is it solving the issue or is it cutting your nose to spite your face? Kind of going back to the point, it's like, I'm, I'm not going to grow food to save the climate, but then the world goes hungry in the process. That doesn't seem like we've accomplished our goal. No, and and the the funny thing is, there's a professor um, that I've actually taken a course from. Her name is Elaine Ingham, and uh, she's a soil microbiologist. And she talks about all the ways to regain the biological structure in the soil, the soil life cycle. And she went to the UN to talk to them about how we can regenerate the ecosystems back into the forest, back into the fields, that's renewable, non-destructive, that actually the agricultural procedure helps the whole ecosystem become stronger. But you have to keep all the participants in mind, which means you're not using the GMO seed, you're not using these chemical fertilizers, you're not destroying creature life to grow food, you're actually using it to create a stronger subsystem. And what did the UN say? We're not interested. So if they're really concerned about the environment, why wouldn't they listen to a professor who's done countless research talking about how we can properly benefit the system and ourselves to have a healthier planet? But that's not really the issue. The issue is to de-individualize people and then to gain a stronger collective. And to have people think that that collective is the moral good. That is the right thing to do. Yeah. And this goes back to Catholic social teachings, which we find ourselves talking about at great length. Uh, I think what's going on a lot with the Supreme Court right now and the fact that there are seven Roman Catholic judges. People are going to clamor and say it's six, it's six, it's not, it's seven. Neil Gorsuch <laughs> is, uh, is an Anglican slash Catholic. He uh, studied with a Catholic theologian. He essentially identifies as Catholic and Anglicans see themselves as a form of new Catholicism. So we're looking at the cat, the core of what makes up their viewpoints of the world. It's seven judges that currently uh, hold sway over the Supreme Court. And why that matters is because kind of like what, what you're touching on is the, the using everyday issues to further promote Catholic social teachings. So how could a food crisis further promote Catholic social teachings. Well, oftentimes when you look at when the Pope talks about the food crisis, he talks about the universal destination of goods, or some can say the common destination of goods. And this is a concept that is a Catholic social teaching that professes that the goods of the world are all of creations. And as a whole, they are... Um, not subject to individual ownership or rights, but are subject to the whole. And this includes the right to private property. Yep. There we go back to the Vancouver Declaration and things of that nature where you're not going to own your own private property because it's actually detrimental to the world. Exactly right. And that is the same basis here in something that's, you know, uh, several hundred years, if not older, theology in this Catholic social teaching that's showing up in something like the Vancouver Declaration, but also it's 2030, you own nothing and you're happy. Yep. Don't all yep. those things kind of sound like the same thing? It's, it's all one in the same system. We have some new updated wording called the 2030 Agenda when it originally was back uh, uh, in the 1900s already, they were talking majorly about this. And then this is going straight back to the Dark Ages, where we had the serfs and the lords, and it was this fascist feudal system where you didn't own, you were given certain things, 
and that's what you did. And you stay in your little compartment and it was, you were dark. You were dark on uh, your individuality. You were dark on your information or your uh, ability to access knowledge on many systems that were not just fed to you as what is the truth. And the scriptures are included in there too, right? So they kept you spiritually yeah. dark, they kept you morally dark, they kept you physically uh, dark, and all of this is based on this universal destination of goods. So when we have things like food shortages, the thing that is brought to the center of the table is that the poorest nations are struggling the most, and that it's the richest or the the top 20% that are, are to blame essentially for this because they're consuming at a rate that is more than poor countries can have. And in essence, what they want to do is they want to balance this out. And so when you have the food shortages, the thing that comes on the table is the idea that uh, food supply chains, resources, they all need to be considered within the global common good structure as a whole. And in essence, that concept isn't a bad one. It's not, I think, that either one of us have any problem with the the idea that there's a there's a, a shortage or a, an, an inequity or some imbalance that probably could use some help to to become more fair and balanced. But that's not what the Catholic Church is trying to accomplish here. They're simply just trying to position the church as the winner slash authority, final say in what anyone is able to do with their body, their mind, their food, their private property, their own family, their own children, all subject to the authority of the church. And if it can't do it by being an outward church, it will do it by putting right the right people in the right places in civil government. And that's what we see with the Roman Catholic president, seven of nine Supreme Court justices. And we could go down the laundry list of powerful Roman Catholics in powerful places, both private and public. But people will say, well, that's an old uh, doctrine, that universality of goods, the private property positions, that's stuff that, you know, is, is different today from the Catholic viewpoint. Well, let's see if that's true or not. Let's go into Laudato Si. And chapter 2, section 6, talks about the common destination of goods. And let's see what Pope Francis's own words have to say about this particular topic. He says, whether believers or not, we are agreed today that the earth is essentially a shared inheritance whose fruits are meant to benefit everyone. For believers, this becomes a question of fidelity to the creator, since God created the world for everyone. Hence, every ecological approach needs to incorporate a social perspective. So this is where that social perspective is called, just replace that, the world needs Catholic social teachings for their ecological approach, is what he's saying which take into account the fundamental rights of the poor and the underprivileged. This is the garb of the papacy. Everything's done in the name of the poor and the needy and the underprivileged. The principle of the subordination of private property, so the subordination of private property to the universal destination of goods, and thus the right of everyone to their use, is a golden rule of social conduct and the first principle of the whole ethical and social order. The Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute or inviolable, and has stressed the social purpose of all forms of private property. St. John Paul II forcibly reaffirmed this teaching. Forcibly. When I say that word force, instantly, whose who's power is behind that when it's related to force? Is that God or Satan's? God doesn't force, Satan forces. Yeah, Jesus died so you wouldn't have to be forced. You could still choose not to choose the one who loved you first, but he died so that you could choose. And here, Pope Francis' own word says that John Paul forcefully reaffirmed this teaching, stating that God gave the earth to the whole human race for the sustenance of its members without excluding or favoring anyone. These are strong words. He noted that a type of development which did not respect and promote human rights, personal and social, economic and political, including the rights of nations and peoples, would not really be worthy of man. 
he clearly explained that the church does indeed defend the legitimate right to private property, but she also teaches no less clearly that there is always a social mortgage on private property in order that goods may serve the general purpose that God gave them. Now, here's the thing. When we really break this down, it, it, it sounds all fine and dandy. We have the poor and the underprivileged. We have these people that need to be taken care of. We have these food shortages happening, and we need to acknowledge those things and we need to figure out a way to uh, support these things. Now, the problem is with the solution because it's not a solution that's actually affecting what they're saying. It's only affecting the opposing party. So we have the structure that says we have, we have the poor and we have the rich and then there's a third category that's actually outside of that framework called the elite and they're a separate group and we're not talking about those people so when they're referencing the rich they're not referencing the people who are in the new world order promotion they're just talking about the rich and they want to reduce the gap they don't want to bring the poor up they want to bring the rich down and the rich are the only ones who can actually help the poor into a better system. Because if you have no one with money and everybody's poor, everybody suffers. You need someone. Yes, we don't need selfish people, but we need people who are hardworking, that they're putting into the system to give jobs, to be able to support these people who are less fortunate or maybe not able to do these things. But that's not the goal. The goal is just to take the upper class and the mid class out and then have all of them here and everybody's the same. That's what we're reading in the book 2052. We need to bring the status down so that you all get the same, which they don't give that uh, straight out front what the definition of the same is, but it's at this low surf level where you don't own anything you're given your food staple, redistribution of wealth, everybody gets their set amount of allowance that the father gives them. And what I find kind of fascinating is that the papacy, as the richest country and richest organization in the history of Earth, goes around saying that everyone needs to give up their wealth, that wealth is the problem. And you see here on page 71 of Laudato Si, it says that, well, let's, let's go back to page 70. It says the natural environment is a, col is a collective good, the patrimony of all of humanity and the responsibility of everyone. Then on page 71, it says, that's why the New Zealand bishops asked what the commandment thou shall not kill means when, quote, 20% of the world's population consumes resources at a rate that robs the poor nations and future generations of what they need to survive. So what this is saying is, 20, you 20% 20 of the world, it's your fault that these nations are poor and that these future generations are going to struggle. And that it's not just that they're going to thrive, that you're basically removing their ability to, to even survive, you 20%. Now, this narrative, the papacy loves to hammer home, is based in what's called liberation theology, which is essentially the concept is if you're not actively doing everything you can to liberate the poor, you are the problem. And the papacy loves this doctrine because it gets people feeling guilty for the blessings that God gave them. Now, let's just do a quick review of some of the richest men in the Old Testament. Abraham. Abraham and Lot had so many goods that they had to split from each other because their countrymen were going at it. What about Solomon? The King, King Solomon. Was there anyone wealthier Richer, more arrayed than, than King Solomon? What about King David? Incredibly uh, wealthy and powerful. Job. Say again? Job. Job was one of the richest people. That's and, right. And, and the interesting thing is, when you look comparatively at countries, the Protestant ones, or the ones that started Protestant, are the wealthier countries. 
and the ones that are Catholic are the poor countries. Now, isn't that strange? Because since the Catholic Church is the one promoting alleviating the poor, but really it's not, it's about reducing the rich, then we see how that makes sense. Because if you bring the top down, it's like bringing someone else down to have your ego go up. Your ego doesn't go up, you're just bringing someone else down to try and match yourself. And so that's really the, the basis. You make a good point. The Protestant nations are the ones that have traditionally thrived the most on an individual economic level. Does that mean every Protestant nation there's no troubles or issues? No, the world is a fallen world. Every place sure. has issues. What's the best standard of living? You're, you're right. It generally has been Protestant nations. And that's fascinating because where are the focus of Protestant nations? On the individual rights and privacies or the common good rights? and, and The individual. Uh, Exactly. The whole system is based on the rights of a human being to think, choose, feel freely, as long as it's not, as it's not infringing on other people's individual rights, to do and think yeah. and, and believe as they choose. That is a lamb-like principle. That's a Christ-like principle. And this force that the, the Catholic Church has historically shown to love so much has led to the, the exact opposite outcome while simultaneously saying that if God has blessed you with lots of goods and means, he also expects a lot from you in the service to other individuals, which is what Abraham did, which is what Job did, which is what David and Solomon, they had lots of people in their households who they treated under the same common uh, law and way of living as they expected. There were no elites and serfs in those households. They all lived under the law of God and under the expectation of what goes along with living uh, righteousness by faith. And those households became blessings because of their abundance. So while, yes, can abundance be used for the bad, is it the source of all evil? Absolutely not. God created whole nations out of people of, of wealth. It, it, it all depends and goes back to the individual character. But we're going to see that this is going to come, let's bring this more tangible and where this is maybe going to go next. So as we see uh, food shortages and supply chain breakdowns and other pieces that will all just bring to the table, hey, we need more global agreement on how we're going to manage all these things. One of those pieces is transitioning the focus of the world to this carbon impact. So yep. while the papacy has a universal destination of goods or common destination of goods mentality, they also want to see this transition to carbon. So your impact, your food, how much you eat, how much you drive, where, how much you, uh, what kind of clothes you wear, all of these things will have carbon impacts. Yep. And this shift will totally allow them to create a new economy or market that's created out of thin air that they can manipulate what you can and can't do and the thresholds of carbon that that are necessary to save the planet and this carbon is going to play a huge role in our future and it already is like we're already seeing the effects of that with the carbon tax and everything and now with them taking that to an even farther point of a point system and uh, the credit card like we showed uh, in the last episode. That's some pretty scary stuff coming down the pipeline. Yeah, and actually, I'm not sure we were able to get to that point. So I want to I want to point to that credit card because it shows how, how real and how close this is to becoming reality in our lives. So the first thing I want to point to was uh, back in 2020, there was a global leaders climate summit. Actually, it may have been 2021. Global Leaders Summit on the Climate. And what's funny is China's sitting at that table, Russia's sitting at that table, Biden's at that table, Merkel, all these people who are at war with Russia right now, we're sitting at a table with them like a year ago, agreeing on this new global framework. Well, they're, 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 all, they're all graduates of the World Economic Forum, which is the most hilarious thing. Because they're all part of the same club. They're all at the same school. They're sitting all at the same table. And now we have this apparent conflict. 
and yeah, opposition. This division and yeah, out of nowhere and but, this guy's the, the the new bad guy for the world to to team up against. I mean, yeah. I but feel for all the people who are involved in that conflict, uh, to say the least, but there's definitely more that than meets the eye going on. So after sitting at this table together, the the head of the UN kind of clarified the position on what they want to do uh, in moving forward with the climate. And here's what he had to say. He said, I'm strongly in favor of a carbon tax. The carbon tax will increase prices. The carbon tax will be unpopular. So what I'm always advocating is to say, let's shift taxation from income to carbon. Think about that for a second. They want to change the world system from an income tax system to a carbon tax system. And he's not just talking corporations here. He's now saying your income won't impact what you can do and buy in the world, your your carbon imprint and the thresholds that they have there will limit what you can do in the world, both from a corporate level and a, and a personal level. So think about this shift to this new carbon tax system. Now, there is already a carbon tax system in, in play. Uh, there are a number of global uh, leaders, countries that have signed up to adhere to this standard. But let's look at how this could cripple first world nations. Because when you think about carbon output or impact, who has in the world uh, the largest carbon impact? Is it somebody in a first world nation living in a first world home in a first world car with a, a first world lifestyle or somebody who's in a third world uh, situation? Uh, the first world I mean, the third world people, they're just tr like in some places, they're just barely making it by. Exactly. In some cases, they would say, look, they have almost zero carbon footprint. But guess what? They also have almost nothing to survive on. So a good, good way to get your carbon footprint to zero is basically... Get to survival you know, mode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now, because we know that the first world nations, first world people are the biggest carbon emitters. And we already know that their goal is to kind of level the playing field and squeeze it. So, and, and people are going to feel that this is their moral obligation, just like we saw with the, the yep. farmer in the yep. Colorado River. Look at what the World Bank says is going to happen to carbon prices. It says the World Bank says only 22% of global emissions were covered by the pricing mechanism, so this, this global carbon tax last year, and the International Monetary Fund put the average global price of carbon at a mere $3 a ton. So just quickly, as they're making these cal calculations, let's say you're a big company like GE, they have now a model that understands how much a corporation like GE puts out and the carbon impact they have a year. Then they say, okay, you have uh, 200 tons of carbon impact that is taxable at the end when everything's canceled out. So it's basically turned into a new tax system. And then they pay $3 a ton for those 200 tons. Well, that's what the price is today. Think of what will happen to GE when that 200 tons is what this committee says will be in the future. It says, yet OECD, this is a committee that uh, evaluates carbon impact, estimates that a price of $147 per ton is needed before 2030 to create enough economic incentives for producers and users of fossil fuels to slash emissions to be net zero by 2050. $3 a ton to $147 a ton now, first yeah. world nations are the biggest expositors of and impacts of, of carbon. What's this going to do to companies' valuations? What's this going to do to economies in the first world nation when this price goes to $147 a ton? Well, and the other thing is, and it's interesting the wording that's used, because it is not, they're not taking that money to now go and fix the planet. The only purpose is to shut down and to destroy most of the industrial mechanisms of the system. That's why they said we need a price, an estimated price of 147 
before 2030 to create enough economic incentives. So we need to put so at least $147 a ton of pressure on the companies, on the private people to stop d wanting even a life. Yeah. Because if you're not allowed to now go out and go for a boat ride, you're not allowed to go drive around your car, go shopping or anything across the country, you know, certain foods, all these wonderful because that outdoor food, activities. Exactly. They are just trying to put pressure. It's not that this is helping anything. They're not taking this money and now planting a tree with it. They're taking their money and they're lining their pockets and investing it into all the things that they've been doing and promoting the new world order system. And so th that's a that's a huge jump. We can see a lot of changes from now in 2022 until 2030. That's we're not going to be in the same world anymore. Well, and I think that's kind of what I want to wrap up here with is the fact that the food shortages, the pandemic, the nation against nation, the all the elements that it's they're going towards this 2030, running, sprinting towards this 2030, that, that they've shared their vision. The the thing's almost a meme by this point. It's 2030 and you own nothing. Everybody gets it. That's that's kind of the mindset. But now how do we get the world to ask for it? Like this Colorado farmer, or excuse me, this California farmer who says, well, it's, it's not good for me, but it's the right thing to do. Because that ultimately is the mindset that we're, we're going to see more and more yeah. people adopt, is this moral standing that they're doing the right thing. And that will eventually play out to be against a small group of people who absolutely refuse to go along with a certain thing that leads to what we know as the mark of the beast. And as we read earlier, calamities and all these issues that are going to come more and more increased and intense are going to be blamed on these people who refuse to follow along. And people will feel eventually morally justified to not essentially tr see them as humans anymore, which what is what leads them to no buy, no sell. Like, how could you stop a, a father from buying his hungry child uh, a piece of fruit well, that's what the Bible says is going to happen, that they cannot buy or sell. That's And, and people are going to feel morally justified in accomplishing this. So yes, we started on food shortages, but I think what we're pointing to is we need to be prepared for that by being prepared for what's going to follow those things. What's the Bible verse that says, you know, God knows what you need before you even ask of it. He knows every hair in your head. Don't worry about what clothes you wear, what food you are eating. He knows those things are needed by you. So our job isn't really to, um, uh, you know, create, go build 14 new storage houses and store up food for ourselves. It's really to increase our faith, to trust God, to deliver us through these times. And that faith will show unto other people that there is something greater happening here that the world cannot touch. And that is something that's held within the individual and exists outside of this collective. But when you see all these individuals come together in faith, it actually makes a real sustainable collective good of the whole. So that's what's kind of strange about the whole thing is if the individual uh, is molded and shaped according to the scriptures, according to the Holy Spirit, uh, for the sake of Christ's righteousness here, then the whole becomes better. But we see the world is teaching it's got to be the other way around. Let's fix the whole and let the individual uh, assimilate to that whole. And if they don't, cut them off, essentially, is what the direction things are going. Now, we have a few different things kind of at play here. Now, we have the fact that there, and even the Bible says that there will be famines, there will be food shortage, there will be these things. And then there's the secondary fact that in the end of Revelation 13, like you mentioned, that people who don't want to comply with the system are going to be uh, denied ability to buy or sell and obtain food, uh, resources, anything, because they're not complying with the system. And that system is the mark of the beast system. So we have a couple things going on here. 
Now, Jesus warned and said, I don't, uh, I, I tell you things before they happen so that you are not caught unaware. He says he's coming as a thief in the night, but that's only for those who are not taking the warnings. It's like the destruction of Jerusalem. He warned the disciples, when you see the Roman armies coming encompassed around the city, take flight. And at the siege of Jerusalem, there were no Christians who perished because they heeded the warning. We have warnings. We know famines are coming. We know there's a time coming when we can't buy or sell. So we don't need to be ignorant and fearful as long as we're heeding the warning. And when we see these things coming, that we do what we're told to do. And that's why when uh, earlier in Revelation 13, there's this beast that looks like it's lamb-like, which is representing America because it's the land of plenty, it's the land of opportunities, it's the land of all these things that are our lamb-like principles. But then it says at the end, it will speak like a dragon. And this Laudato Si and this redistribution of wealth and all these things is speaking like a dragon. There is no right of the individual anymore. Yeah, it's certainly starting to to really form its dragon-like tongue. And I just think it's fascinating that that just happens to coincide with the most Catholic-dominated uh, U.S. political and judicial system in America's history. So are those two things coincidental? Uh, I don't think so. But uh, Mackenzie, I believe that's all we have for today. Uh, we hope to continue to come back with more things. We have some interesting points for uh, the Supreme Court that we may discuss coming up, uh, as well as um, some other pieces regarding uh, separation of church and state issues that are going on within uh, narratives within the American political system and knocking down some of those walls between the separation of church and state. So lots to talk about, uh, but we are to be the watchmen. So we hope that this really uh, turns you guys back to the scriptures. Go back to the word. Uh, look at the conditions and start um, asking questions. And if you don't understand, uh, reach out and, and start um, asking what certain parts mean and how they connect. Because a lot of people today will tell you that everything's about Russia and China uh, coming out and, and playing very significant roles, where I think our focus has been pretty well laid out for this next phase here to focus on America and the papacy. Um, and so we want to keep people focused there, but also focused on their relationship personally with Jesus Christ. Uh, we're not to get worked up, agitated, or, or angry, but show more and more compassion and love for those who don't understand these things yet and uh, develop ourselves that Christ-like character that is able to uh, walk as Christ did and as his apostles did uh, through their times of trials, which I think we should see again. So thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, God bless. We'll see you next time. And keep watching because in the future, we'll probably come back and talk a little bit more about what we can do as individuals uh, in preparing for some of the things that we're talking about. Amen. God bless you. See you next time. Thank you.